amazing time of worship, and I don't know if you experienced it, but just such a touch from God. And I was thinking it's so significant. I wasn't here last week, but that we started the year with a worship service, and there was no preaching, just pushing into God's presence. And um, those who were here said it was amazing. And I was just thinking about that verse, into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And wouldn't it be amazing if this was a year where you just enjoyed God's presence like you've never enjoyed it before, that you spend time in his presence, that you experience breakthrough. And I love the series that we're doing because I think it gives us some amazing tools for breakthrough and some beautiful and good things that hopefully you'll be equipped with as we look at God's word. And we were speaking about the, the whole um, idea of patterns. And I like the word patterns. You also, we talk about disciplines. And some people have had bad experience with discipline as it being harsh, but God's ways are always good. He's a loving Father who has the best for us. So even when we use the word discipline, or di being disciplined by God, or getting involved in the disciplines, it's not a bad thing. His ways are so good. But we're also using the word patterns. And so I was looking at patterns and just kind of what comes to mind, and we've got a little quiz that we can put up. And if you can get this very quickly, I'm not going to spend too long on it. You probably won't. Um, could you tell me what the letter in the second star should be? You can get an extra slice of cake in the Connect Cafe if you can get it in the next 20 seconds. Anyone? Anyone? G? No, you're just guessing rolls. <laughs> yeah, Nick? No? Anyone? Anyone? What's that? No, now you guys are just randomly guessing letters. <laughs> it's like, it's a matter of time before we get it. I'll give it to you. It's J, because this is a complicated one. But basically, each, each letter, um, if you give it the number that it is in the alphabet, for example, E is, what, 5? B is 2. And then you actually you take all those and you divide it. The middle one gives you the average. That's so obscure. It really irritated me when I got the answer, because it took me forever to try and get it, and I never got it. Oh yeah, but what you can see is all of a sudden, when you see a pattern, things become very clear and obvious. And so I kind of really hate these sort of quizzes where you have no idea, and then all of a sudden you can see, and all of a sudden it makes sense. And it's the same in, in God's kingdom, that there's certain things that if we put these patterns into place, we can kind of predict future outcomes. And so if you're putting certain things in place in your life, you can kind of guess that, for example, we're speaking about prayer tonight, and if you put the whole habit of prayer into your life, you can guess that when you're going to go through tough times, when you're going to go through hard times of not hearing from God, that you'll probably still be a person of prayer because that is the pattern that you've put in your life. I was thinking about patterns as well, and they're, they're good patterns that we can put into our lives, and that's a sign of maturity. As you start to master certain things, for example, you, a lot of you have written exams, and if you can get down to really just studying and pacing yourself and doing the work that's required, that's a sign of maturity because probably when you were in grade whatever and you started doing exams for the first time, your mom had to kind of probably sit behind you and, and ensure that you study because that's a sign of immaturity, um, not being able to have those patterns. Well, sometimes another sign of immaturity is having destructive patterns. And so if you um, can see people whose lives are being destroyed by addictions, they're giving into those destructive patterns. And I was thinking, just excuse me, because it's the second time I'm using our dog as an illustration in the last few times, but she, doesn't, she can't watch reruns of the sermon. And so I can talk about her and her failures. But basically, so we got this dog and we had high hopes for her. But I researched the breed hugely because we were deciding what kind of a dog we were going to get. And we kind of nailed it. We thought, Vimarana, intelligent, athletic, um, great indoors. For some reason, I wanted what they called a Velcro dog, which is a dog that walks behind you all the time and doesn't leave you. Now I regret that because now I have a son and two dogs that walk behind me all the time. Um, but I thought all these things were good. And she really was an intelligent and athletic dog. Is. She's still alive. Um, we took her to dog training, and I was so proud of her because um, we, we, we would take her through these drills, and she was like one of the fastest dogs there, and at the end of the year, they do this competition, and we walked away with all these like flower trophies, and I was so proud. I know it's ob, but it actually was quite special, <laughs> and, um, and she was also intelligent. When we started teaching her things, I was like, gee, she learns quite quickly, but there was another side that was starting to rise up, and that was her crazy. And the one day I took her to the park and I was just walking, she was still a puppy. And there was a, a kind of metal boom where you can lift it up so that the, a car can go in. And so we were at the park and all of a sudden she saw a bird 
and she wanted to chase this bird. And so she just went at full force. She didn't listen to me. All my little behavioral, like, come here, Jesus. None of it worked. And she just went flying. And I thought, oh, no, because there's a busy road on the other side. This dog is going to get killed tonight. And so I freaked out. But lo and behold, I don't know if it was God's protection or what it was, but she ran straight into this pole, into this boom, and bounced back. And so I was like, oh my goodness. And I ran to her to check how she was. And I thought, well, I know when a kind of an adult or a person's knocked themselves out, you kind of ask how many fingers. That's all I knew. So I thought, well, what do I do with her? So I thought, okay, let me see if she can still sit and if she can still down. And she sat him down perfectly. But then all of a sudden, the blood started coming. And I was catching her. She'd given herself a blood nose. And I'd never seen this in a dog before, but I was holding her and I had to take her to the vet. And there was blood all over my car. And I remember asking the vet and I said... (laughs) It's quite strange that it happened. Do you, do you think that she has an eyesight problem? And I remember his response to me is he said, no, my love, that's her brain. And all of a sudden, my like, great, I have the most awesome dog in the world deflated. And over time, we saw the crazy rise. And if I can have the next slide, is that all of a sudden, she was now this dog, and we added a second one in the mix, who knows why, who was sitting on the other dog, who was destroying toilet paper, who was taunting us if we locked her outside through the window, who was pulling tongues out at us like Miley, sitting on the couch when she shouldn't be, and then standing at the gate and terrorizing our neighbors. It's so bad that we actually, just to my embarrassment, we went to enroll our son in a little preschool around the corner from us, just behind us. And when I explained to the lady where we lived, she said, oh, you're the one with the wild dogs. And we don't keep them at the front, but they have this way of like the one time that they'll get there, this woman's walking with her, and this is his future principal, and she's walking with her dog, and our dogs terrify the life out of her child. So we just have that sort of reputation. And I just thought, how did it get there? This dog had all the potential in the world. Both of them do. And they are intelligent, and we could have done so much. And I realized it's because we were in training them. And what highlighted it to me was the fact that someone else in our church owns the brother of one of the dogs, and he's winning awards at the dog school. He's doing so well. Every time on Facebook, I'm just seeing another award and just thinking, well, that could have been us. It's quite pathetic. Um, and, and just realizing that I, we actually let things slip because the reality is that we haven't been training the dogs like we should. We've let the crazy rise up, the kind of bad behavior rise. And the disciplines and the patterns, the good patterns, have kind of sunk a bit. And I just realized that in life, that can happen to us. And especially in our walk with God, we've got all this amazing potential for God to do such amazing things in our life. But we let the destructive patterns, we kind of tone them up and we kind of tone the good things down. And so I just love the fact that tonight we're going to be speaking about prayer. And even when I was preparing this, I just did it in a slightly different way. And I just journaled for myself what I need to hear about prayer and what God can do in my life. And so this has also just been a very personal thing, exercise that I've done in the week. Um, as I've worked through, how can my prayer life be better? How can I just see it go at the end of the year and just go, this has actually been a good year in terms of prayer. And we're going to be speaking about three things. I have an aversion to three-point sermons with punchy little sayings, and I'm doing that tonight because it's holidays and our brains are on a break, so we just need simple. And firstly, I'm going to be speaking about the privilege of prayer, the power of prayer and the pattern of prayer, because before we look at the patterns, I think we need to be convinced about the fact that prayer is a privilege, and Brad was praying that in the prayer meeting. He was speaking about us seeing the privilege and the power of prayer, and I was like, thank you, God, because those were my first two things I was going to say. Because we need to be convinced of those before we put patterns in our life of prayer, because that will change. And I just thought about it, and I thought the whole um, idea of, of prayer and having breakthrough in this area Um, It has to do with our intimacy, our love relationship with God. Prayer is probably the most intimate thing that you can do and enjoy with God. I love his word. I love worship. But it's that time where you can just have a conversation with God. And so it's such a beautiful thing. But the devil hates intimacy because God has designed it. So if you look at what he does in marriages, he tries to break down intimacy, be it physical, emotional, spiritual. Because if he can break down intimacy, he can break down the relationship. And I think it's the same with our prayer life um, and our walk with God. If he can break down that intimacy that we have, then he actually wins because we don't pray anymore. We don't want to speak to God. We don't have that desire to just be in God's presence. And then I was thinking of a few things that, um, that he tries to do, and this is not an exhaustive list, but the first one is a lie. He tells us a lie that we're not worthy. And I love that James, in the prayer meeting, and then 
Um, Nick also started with it, addressed the whole thing of not being worthy. And James felt, like in the prayer meeting, that this was going to be a thing for us tonight, that there were going to be people here who are affected by, uh, whose prayer lives are affected because they don't feel like they're worthy before God. And so if that's you, you've been prayed for already. And his word is that God's banner over you is love. So if you're in that place, I just thought that's amazing. It was confirmation for me that, that God wants you to know that you're more than worthy because he's a good father and he loves you. Then that prayer is not my thing. I do other things in the church, but prayer is just not it. You know, I battle to focus, I battle to connect with God, and so prayer just isn't my thing. But I do other things that I don't have the time to pray. I would pray if I wasn't busier, but there's so much I have to do to survive. That there's no power in prayer. That I've just, I've prayed before and I've been disappointed. And I remember if you've ever had to do Shakespeare sonnets, I think it's sonnet number 29 in, in Shakespeare, speaks about kind of speaking to deaf heaven with bootless cries and almost saying like, God isn't hearing, he's deaf and my, pr- and my prayers lack a punch, they lack a kick. And so I just thought it was such a tragic way, but Christians can often feel like that too, that, that God isn't hearing and my prayers have no power. And that prayer isn't that important in the believer's life. You know, it's something you can do when you're old. Then you can start interceding for people when you've got a lot more time on your hands. I'm okay like this. Like, I've actually cruised through life without having so much prayer, doing so much prayer. So, actually, I'm okay this way. Or that others can stand in the gap to me. Is your first response to pray when you're going through crisis? Or is it to SMS a whole lot of friends and tell them what's happening and then say, oh, please pray. And then all they all reply. And you kind of know that they're not really going to pray for you. But it's almost more like a good luck charm. And that's what often can happen in, in church circles. So we're just going to look at the privilege of prayer. It is such a beautiful thing that we can come to our Heavenly Father and speak to Him, the creator of the universe. And in the Bible, there's a way of um, sometimes some people kind of look into to God's word and just look at, the, at something called the law of first mention. Some say it's junk, others say it's significant. But often when you're looking at something in the Bible, and the first time it's mentioned, it's often significant because it's a concept that will get built on. It explains the heart of it. And, um, and so sometimes I like just doing it as an interesting study. And I was looking at as an, and thinking about the first time that prayer gets mentioned um, in the Bible, and the first time that a recorded conversation between man and God. And it's actually an interesting one because it's not the most pleasant conversation. But if you look at Genesis 3, verse 8 to 13, and I'm going to read it now, it shows God's and man's first conversation, recorded conversation with each other. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So from that, some people assume that that was a regular thing that God used to do, but we don't know hundred percent and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man where are you he answered I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid and he said who told you that you are naked have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to eat from not to eat from the man said the woman put me here with um, the woman you put here with me she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. And so although it's quite a a negative thing, there's some nice principles we can take out. And the first is that that God actually initiates the conversation. He says, Where are you? And God just taking that beautiful step. And where would we be if God didn't take the first step in our lives? It was a painful conversation. But I don't know about you, but sometimes... My painful relational conversations have left me in a better place than I was before. And I actually thank God for people in my life that have had painful conversations with me. I thank God for the times that he's pointed things out in my life that have been painful. And sin had actually ruined that conversation. There was this thing now between them. There was shame, there was guilt, there was hiding from God. But God made a plan. And if you read through the rest of Genesis, through the rest of the Bible, you see the plan that God is making to have this relationship, to get right with man again. And it's such a beautiful plan. And in the fact that we see God and man speaking to one another, this is a conversation. When, when, when I hate the way that sometimes we describe, and I sometimes get into that, but what is prayer? It's talking to God. But it's not talking to God because then it makes it a one-sided thing. It's God and me talking to each other. That is the beauty of prayer. It's a conversation. And then you also see Adam and Eve had to lay themselves open. They had to be seen by God. And it was actually just the most honest conversation. 
And prayer should be the most honest conversation that you are ever having. You should be turning to God in prayer and telling him first. And isn't it amazing that we can have a beautiful conversation with the creator of the universe, with the God who loves us. What a privilege. And I was thinking about the fact that even in the Old Testament, we, we see this beauty of prayer. We see something as, as people of prayer just rise up and stand in the gap. In Daniel chapter 2, if you know the story, when Daniel gets called to interpret a dream, firstly what happened is Nebuchadnezzar has a terrible dream. He calls his wise men in to try and get an interpretation. And none of them can do it. Not even interpretation. They must tell him what he dreamt because he can't remember the dream. And then interpret it. And their words to Nebuchadnezzar is, what you're asking us to do, no man can do. And he's absolutely right. They're absolutely right. Because then they call in Daniel. And what does Daniel do? He goes to God because only God can do it. It's a privilege that you can access God and hear from God when others can't. What a beautiful thing. And then you even see how this, their prayers affect change. Because later, with these three friends, they, the three friends get thrown into the furnace. Um, they don't burn up. The king Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. And then, and then actually because of that whole process and because of them being people of prayer, the nations, the ruling gets changed where everyone has to now worship God and, and he acknowledge him as the true God. And so you just see how those little things of people of prayer just rising up and them having conversations that, that only they can have with God because only they have that relationship. But it's definitely a privilege we don't want to keep to ourselves. And that's the amazing thing that in Daniel you see how these young people affected change, how people were able to hear God's name because of their prayers. And then in the New Testament, we see how the Holy Spirit comes alongside the church and just helps them to pray. And there's this new beautiful era where they've experienced Jesus and now they're stepping out in prayer. And I love Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, which once again probably sums up for me the biggest privilege of prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is such a privilege. You can walk into this year with a peace of God. That is such a beautiful promise to believers. The next thing is the power of prayer. And when, it, when, when we talk about that, we really, we so often water down the power of prayer. How many prayers have you said where you haven't really believed in what God was going to do, that there was actual power and you kind of maybe on a head level knew that you needed to pray, but your heart didn't believe in the power of prayer. And when we're praying from that point, it's a very defeated point that we're praying from. But there's power in prayer. And I just love, I was going through the New Testament and just looking at how the early church prayed and in what situations they prayed in because that reflected their, their kind of belief in the power of prayer. And it was basically every situation they were praying in. So I'm just going to look through a few. And the first is that the believers prayed when they were gathered together. Acts 1 verse 14 says they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women um, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. And then in Acts 2.42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then the believers prayed when they were being sent off. And that's what we're going to be doing a little bit later for Ryan, because we're sending him off. And so if you look at Acts 21 verse 5, when it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. What a beautiful send-off. And there's another scripture from Acts I'm not going to go through, but it says Barnabas and Saul um, are being sent out and set apart. And then the believers prayed when they were faced with choices. When they had a decision to make, Acts 1 verse 24 to 25. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. And isn't it amazing that, that, I, that so often, and I've even done this when I've been praying for a decision, is that you pray kind of expecting not to get an answer and kind of going, will God just close a door, whichever door isn't right. That's not a really a prayer of faith. That's a prayer of unbelief. A prayer of faith is, Lord, show us what the right choice is. We're coming here to ask you. And that's what they were doing. The believers prayed through hardship. In Acts 12, um, verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And then it goes on to explain how, um, how he actually gets released miraculously from prison. And then the 
believers prayed for healing and for people being raised back to life. And in Acts 9 verse 40, there was, there was um, a disciple, and her name was um, Tabitha, or her Greek name the Bible talks about is it's more memorable, it's Dorcas. Um, and she, she died suddenly, and this is what happened. Um, they, they call for Peter. And the, Peter sent them out of the, all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. It sounds so normal. Imagine witnessing that. Um, Acts 28 verse 8 speaks that they were on the island of Malton. It speaks about one of the chief officials. And what happened is his father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went to see him, and after, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. It just seems like it was the norm. This is what they were being exposed to all the time. And I wonder if these prayers were so possible because prayer was just a part of their lives. If the only things we're praying for is healings and people coming back to life, maybe, maybe that's our problem is that we're only coming to God with these things when we really need him. When maybe if prayer was just a part of our life and just the norm, all of a sudden praying for the sick and seeing someone being raised back to life might become very normal because that's how we work in God's kingdom. And so we've limited God by the scope of our prayers and the fact that we're not letting him into every aspect. The believers prayed for opportunities. Oh, the believers had an attitude of prayer or devotion to prayer. In Colossians, we see the verse, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And in Romans 12, verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And just that call for us to be devoted, to be faithful. The believers prayed for opportunities to evangelize. If you look in Colossians, it says, And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I'm going to skip the Ephesians one, but there's so many scriptures where they, they're just um, praying about just sharing God's word and just having the power, the authority, or the boldness. The believers prayed to confess. And this is something that I think we don't do enough of, is just coming before God and just confessing. James 5 verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And just that confessing to one another. If you've ever experienced that, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And if the early church, if this was the norm for them, it would have been a really beautiful thing and the liberating thing to instead of hiding our sins from one another, to actually go and confess. And then the believers prayed to build each other up. And I love this. Imagine, because I was thinking about it when I was just kind of typing these things out, is imagine someone praying this prayer for me. What a beautiful worded prayer. Ephesians 1 verse 16 to 19. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength. That power is the same as the, as the mighty strength. What a beautiful prayer that you could pray for someone else. And then the believers prayed to give thanks. In Colossians we see we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. And then finally they prayed at all times. So it sums it up. Ephesians 6 verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayer requests, with this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And then Thessalonians, pray continually. Simple verse to remember. That can be your one you remember for the, for the year. Pray continually. And uh, do you get the picture of a bunch of people who firstly want God in every aspect of their lives, who consciously acknowledge him and speak to him, who believe that he's a God who answers prayer, who sees the importance of praying together and praying for each other. Isn't it so beautiful? This, for me, just shows that these people knew the power of prayer. And I thought, well, what is different for us today? Nothing is different. We've just watered it down. Yes, they were kind of living in the, in the days where Jesus had been on earth and there was this excitement, but same Holy Spirit that we have today. In fact, we've got bigger communities. We've got more worship. We've got more things to help us pray and to help us to know the power of prayer. And so I just want to challenge you just on the first, knowing the privilege of prayer and knowing the power of prayer 
before you get into the pattern of prayer. And if you need to go and process those, do that first before we look at the patterns. The danger of looking at patterns of prayer is that we can fall into legalism, we can fall into, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. And if you're doing it from that place, you're not going to learn to love prayer. You're going to learn to love prayer if you do it from a love relationship, wanting to honor God, wanting to spend time in His presence. So I just want to, and I think through the whole series, we've also just been praying that it won't come across as legalistic. You have to do this because you will feel like a failure. But if you do these things, look how wonderful they are. You can enjoy a freedom with God. And so I've got a few questions, and they were ones that I just kind of also put together for myself. And it's not, um, it's not a, it covers some things, as, some aspects, of, our, of the, our pattern of prayer. And for all of us, our answers are going to be different. But I just kind of brainstormed a few questions under a few headings. Um, and the first one is, what place is my, are my prayers coming from? Kind of, what kind of place am I in when I'm praying? And are your prayers powered by the Holy Spirit? Is that the place it's coming from? I love, in Romans, it speaks about, we don't know what we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit helps us in groans that words can't even understand. And and just that whole thing of the Holy Spirit has come to be our helper, to come alongside us, to help us in our weaknesses. And so it's a privilege to pray with him. We don't do it out of ritual. We don't read um, just prayers and, and, and meaningless words. We pray with the help of the Holy Spirit. And if you're battling and you don't feel like you've got God's power, it's there for you. It's what he offers us. It's, it's part of prayer, the Holy Spirit, and having his help. And then also it being a manifestation of a love relationship. Is your prayers, are they coming from a heart of love? Is it a manifestation and an overflow? Because if you don't feel like you love God, then you need to take a step back and learn to love him again, because then your prayers will be different. And then are you gaining ground? Are you going to new places with God? I hope that every year for the rest of my life, I'm always moving in a kind of a new place with God and and kind of moving and taking fresh ground when it comes to prayer. And then the next thing is timing. How are you doing with timing? What is your pattern looking like? Are you giving God your best time of your day? I'm battling with this at the moment because I don't find I've got a best time. I don't have any any good times. There's no time. But um, so this has been something I've had to kind of fight through and go, what is the best time that I can give God? When can I actually be my most with him? And that will change from year to year. But are you being strategic about what time you spend with God? Consistency, that's the whole idea of patterns, is that we can kind of determine things from our past behavior. Are you being consistent? Because it adds, and every day that you're kind of adding that discipline and doing it more and more, it just becomes part of your life. And then is it a priority, or is it the first thing you drop when other things come your way? And then the next thing is, are you hearing from God? I love when Psalms, it says, search me and know me. And just that whole thing of, of, um, does God search you? Are you you hearing from him in every aspect of your life? I think that's how I word it, every aspect of your life, even the tough stuff. And so, because this is the thing with God, is that when he searches you and he knows you, he's going to speak to you about yourself. And I find that the first things, before I come into God's presence, that I need to do is actually deal with the hard stuff, the sin issues. Um, In Psalm 66, verse 18, it says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. And so I always find that just a good way to start praying is to actually deal with the, the thought, like hear from God, like God, what is being offensive to you? What, is, what am I doing that is standing in the way of me experiencing you? And, and once I've heard all the hard things, it's then easier to heal the good things because I'm not cherishing sin in my heart anymore. I'm letting God deal with it. And then are you testing what you're hearing from God? I think it's so easy for us to just go, oh, I heard this from God. God's told me to do this. And you make these kind of unwise moves when you haven't really pushed through and tested what God is saying. And so are you testing what you think you're hearing? And then are you also, as you're hearing from God, are you hearing for other people? Is your prayer life bigger than yourself? Because so often we can be praying about our lives and our little kingdom and our little world when we should also be praying for others. And that's such a significant, if you look back to the New Testament, how many prayers were actually said for others? And so a significant part of our prayer life and, and our habits should actually be prayer for others, prayer for the church, prayer for the unsaved. And then, am I protecting my love relationship? If we look, we need to be in a continual pattern of protecting our prayer life 
and protecting that intimacy, putting a, a little special hedge around it. And I was thinking about just a few things as your aspects of your love relationship, your aspects of your prayer life. And I was thinking about things, are you, are you putting things in like worshiping God and, and just keeping a quiet time journal so that you can look back and you can kind of see what God is doing? Are you spending time maybe speaking aloud to God and other times just being quiet before Him and being still before Him? Are you, are you praying in different spaces? Are you continually praying? Are you praying kind of in your room, in the intimacy of, with your Heavenly Father? And then are you praying as you go to work and continually handing things over? And prayer retreats. Now, I haven't done one for a while, and sometimes they're actually very hard to do, just to take some time. But most people who've had significant times with God and significant breakthrough, it's often been on prayer retreats. And I've heard such amazing testimonies of people who've just pushed through with God. And that has been a marker thing in their lives. So just taking time to keep things, to keep things fresh, to keep things kind of new with God. And then I'm mentioning it again because I think it's that serious, but the whole thing of sin because we need to protect our love relationship by dealing with sin seriously. And in Job 31 verse 1, it says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at young women. Now, I don't want to focus on the lustfully at young women, but that whole thing, it just shows how Job took it so seriously that he made a covenant with his eyes. He did not want to offend God, so that's what he did. He made a promise. And that's how seriously we need to take sin of just making covenants and just going, Lord, I don't want anything to interfere with my prayer life. So this is what I'm going to do. Because the devil will attempt to entice us and desensitize us. And, and, and I was thinking about the sound desk because Trevor's always moaning about people fiddling with it. And something will happen from one Sunday to the next where miraculous in the week, people have kind of changed all the levels again. And I thought it's, some, it's kind of like that, is that sometimes we don't notice when the sin's coming in and it's affecting our life. But all of a sudden, prayer and all these other patterns and disciplines kind of get turned down a bit. And other things get turned up. And it happens so easily and subtly that we don't, until all of a sudden we try to switch a microphone on and it's shrieking. And, and just all of a sudden there's this huge imbalance. And so sometimes we just have to be so careful. And that's why it's, so, it's better to, to treat sin seriously right at the beginning than to let it go, let it go, let it go, until all of a sudden everything's out of whack. And then also just the role of the word in, in of the Bible, God's word in your life. It's there to test things. It's there to encourage us. It's there to teach us new things about prayer, how to pray. Maybe you don't even know how to pray. The Bible's a perfect way to start. So is the word a part of your prayer life too? And then lastly, who? Who are we praying for? Who are we praying with? And I think the most important thing is to, how's your prayer life, your alone time going? That time when it's just you and God. Matthew 6 verse 5 speaks about just closing the door and just being you and God and no one else seeing. And it's such a beautiful thing to have that intimacy with God. But then also in small groups, are you just praying one-on-one, -on -one, that whole thing of confessing to one another, maybe in your life groups, just people you really know and trust and enjoying the intimate times of prayer with them. And in corporate prayer, which is we're going to, what we're going to be doing in a week. And, and this is something that we often fall short in because all of a sudden when we bring the whole church together, there are people that are so different to me that are praying and, and I just can't connect with them. But that is the beauty of corporate prayer is that we shouldn't be selfish. There should be more of us praying in corporate prayer meetings. And so that is something I really want you to think about this year, to be more committed to our church prayer meetings. Um, they happen once a month. There are some other ones that happen. But just praying with God's people, because that was such a significant part of the New Testament church. It was something they did. I know I was chatting to Kate, and I know she works at CBN. A few other people in our church do. You can find out more about the organization. But they also make prayer priorities. So that I know on a Wednesday at lunchtime, anyone can come and pray with them. They've even got a prayer line where you can phone in. There's so many other organizations we support where we should be coming alongside them and praying with them so that we don't just go, I'm going to be praying for you. And so those are just a few things to, to kind of challenge us, to evaluate our own prayer life this, this year and just go, maybe a few things need to change. Because when I did that and I answered some questions, I straight away saw what needed to improve and change in my life. And as I said, it's something we don't want to be legalistic about. God is our holy, with the Holy Spirit. He helps us in our weaknesses. And I just want to end with one of my favorite um, hymns as a kid was one called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And the words always stuck with me. And often when I'm going through hard times, it, I get reminded of it. So most of you probably don't know it. But it goes, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 
Um, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And for me, it always, just as a kid, I even remember thinking, oh, sure, if you don't pray, you know, you're kind of the poor for it. Sometimes we just waste time because we don't carry things to God in prayer. So I'm going to be ending off here, and I'm just going to, I'm going to actually ask, we've got some of our pastors and elders and, and to pray for us and help us to pray. I don't know if you noticed at the, at the bottom of my slides, I had some quotes, um, but th- there was one by Francis Chan that I just threw in, and it was one that said, um, uh, me loving, something about me loving prayer was an answer to prayer. <laughs> And so sometimes we need people to pray for us, and we need to pray that we actually learn to love prayer. And so I just thought it would be nice for a few of our, our leaders to pray for, for all of us as a congregation, that we will learn to love prayer, that we'll have breakthrough in this area, that we'll see ourselves as worthy, and then roles will just lead into our time of praying for Ryan. So I'm just going to pray, and then if any of you do want to, you can come and grab the, the mic. But we just want breakthrough in this area. Lord, we know that you're a good Father, that your Holy Spirit comes alongside us to help us in our weaknesses. We want to spend this year in your presence because that is the best way to spend this year. Lord, we don't know what the year is going to hold. There's so many changes for so many, but Lord, we know that we can cons- you can be our constant anchor in life. What a privilege to speak to the creator of the universe. So Lord, we pray for breakthrough in this area. We pray that our patterns will be ones that you put forward. And and Lord, just speak to us all differently. We know we're all in different places here with you, but we trust you, Father. Amen. Father, I just want to pray for us. Just thank you for your word. I want to pray for our people, God, that they would learn to allow the Spirit to set the agenda for their prayer. God, I just pray that you would cultivate a love in our hearts to be talking with you and to be talking to you. And God, not to feel insignificant or to wonder or question whether you have the power to fulfill a prayer. Holy Spirit, won't you come and break down those walls? Cause us to have too much to pray for, Lord. And to desire to be there and throughout the day, God, to be communing with you. But I pray that as your people would be like Paul who constantly had in him an atmosphere of prayer and an attitude of prayer. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this reflection on spending time in your presence in prayer, Lord, the reminder that it's a two-way thing, and so often we are just so distracted by the pace of life and busyness that we don't spend time to listen and hear your still, small voice. Lord, we really just pray that through your Spirit, you will teach each one of us to prioritize more time with you and not time for just shopping list prayers. Lord, we confess that so often that's how we pray when we've got issues and troubles and things we're worried about. We quick to rattle those off and ask you to deal with them. But we certainly don't spend enough time just listening to you and just being in your presence and hearing what you want to say to us. So Lord, we really just earnestly pray that through your spirit, 2018 might be a time of breakthrough in the space. Lord, we know that the evil one wants to get at our relationship with you and there are so many distractions uh, that that just kind of muscle their way in and so easily uh, you just get put on the sidelines. So, Lord, I really pray that for each of us this might be a year where we really, through your strength, discipline ourselves to spend more time in your presence and to allow that power of prayer to work in us and and through us to reach out to others. So thank you, Lord, that we, we, you have our backs on this and that we're not doing it on our own and that we can trust in you and in the power of your spirit in us to be able to just have special breakthrough this year and the years that lie ahead as we seek to draw closer to you in prayer. Amen. Yeah, we thank you, Lord, that we, we have an understanding of what it means to be disciplined and at the same time, Lord, we understand uh, what it means to be in love. And Lord, we pray that we would have both in the area of prayer. That Lord, we would be disciplined in our setting aside time. That Lord, we'd be disciplined in in making it a priority. That we'd be disciplined, Lord, in, in bringing things to you, Lord, not as a shopping list. But Lord, because of the things that are on our heart. Because you're so intimately involved in everything that we stand for and everything we do. 
And then, Lord, we pray that you would help us just to, to fall deeper in love with you. Because, Lord, it's out of that deep love relationship that we will want to spend time with you. It's out of that deep relationship, Lord, that we'd want to be communicating with you. We want to be listening to you. We want to be sharing the very deep things in our hearts because we love you so much and we want you to know what's going on. And so, Lord, we, we, we ask you, Lord, that you would help us, yeah, Lord, to be both disciplined and also, Lord, to be, to be more in love with you. Uh, Lord, may this be a daily thing. May it be something, Lord, that's, that's not just tagged on at the end of a day or, or pushed in at the beginning of the day because we know that it's something we have to do. But, Lord, it will be a, a daily thing of falling deeper and deeper in love with you and spending more and more and more time with you. Lord, I just think of a, a colleague who said, I, I, can't, I can't cope with the day unless I've spent three hours with my Jesus. Lord, help us to be are so in love with you that we want to spend time, more and more and more time with you. Now I just remember that uh, quote uh, made by Francis Chan. I just think it's such a powerful quote. My love for prayer is an answer to prayer. My love for prayer is an answer to prayer. So Lord, we come to pray tonight. Will you answer that prayer for us too? Lord, that each one of us here, each part here of Connect Church, Lord, may we love prayer because you've answered this prayer tonight. May we fall in love with you at a deeper level. And Lord, may we love time with you. May we love speaking to you. May we love listening to you. Because you are our Father who gives good gifts to them that ask him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, Ryan, come and stand with me on the stage.